Jesus approached Jerusalem just prior to his crucifixion, the question on everybody's lips was, when? When is the kingdom of God going to be established? When is Jesus going to become king of the world? And Jesus responded to that question in Matthew 24 by telling them the Olivet prophecy because he was on the Mount of Olives just near Gethsemane. And so in Matthew 24, he explained to the people that there'll be signs to look for to tell you of the nearness of the return of Jesus. He told them that there'll be nations wanting to war, rumors of war, nation rising against nation. He speaks of in nature how that there'll be earthquakes and famines and difficulties for people living in the world at that time and to look for those signs. But he also says in Matthew 24, these words. In verse 36, he says, no man knows the day nor the hour of the return of Jesus. In verse 42, he says, watch for you know not the day nor the hour. And in verse 44, he says, be ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man will come. And so Jesus tells the people and warns the people and encourages the people to be ready because nobody knows the day nor the hour that the Son of Man or the Son of God will come and that the kingdom of God will be established. And then he says in verse 45, he asks them a question. He says, well, who then is a faithful and wise servant. And Jesus is going to use both those words, both the word wise and faithful in Matthew 25, when he tells the story or the parable of the 10 virgins, the fifth in our series of the magnificent seven parables, and then follows that by the parable of the talents, which will be our sixth of this series. And so Jesus uses these words of being prepared and watching concerning his time of return, concerning the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth. And so having explained the Olivet prophecy to the people, Jesus then goes into Matthew 25 and introduces us to this parable of the ten virgins. And it's a parable again that's very familiar to us. In fact, sometimes with these parables, we're so familiar with the story because we've heard it so many times from even from a young age that the parable and the message within it can lose its impact. It can lose its power because within these parables, within these stories, Jesus has a hidden message, a hidden message about him, a hidden message about the kingdom. And he wants us to understand these things. But if we're not careful, we become so familiar with them, they lose their impact or they lose their power to us. Now, in this case, the, the parable of the, the ten virgins, the virgins represent the bride, the bride of Christ. This is the group of people that Jesus has been calling to follow him, that God has been calling out to be a part of his family, and they are identified as the virgins in the parable, but in reality, they are the bride of Christ. Under Jewish tradition, what would happen is that that when a person became engaged, betrothed to, then the bride would wait for the bridegroom to come. And so the bridegroom would come and there'd be a big announcement and then the bride would leave her home and go and meet her bridegroom. And they would go and greet with great joy and great excitement and then go in for the wedding ceremony and the marriage supper of that couple. But I want you to notice in Matthew 25, where we find this parable recorded for us, in the first verse, we're given certain information. For example, we are told that there are 10 virgins who are representing the bride. The 10 virgins represent the members of God's family. They've accepted the bridegroom's proposal, the bridegroom's invitation to marry him. And so this group of 10 virgins represent those that have come in to the family of God because it's God's son that's going to get married. And so they've come into the family of God through baptism. They've all been called. These 10 virgins have all been called. So they are all called. They are all invited. 
And being virgins, they are identifying themselves as people who have good morals. They have good moral lives. And we need to understand that this parable is telling us in, 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 in a very clear and a very forceful manner that this is not about good works versus evil. This is not about salvation by works in this parable. Because all have sinned. You've sinned. I've sinned. Everybody's sinned. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. This parable is not about five wise virgins that are living a good, wholesome life on the straight and narrow path compared to the five foolish virgins who are living this terrible, sinful life running around behaving badly. That's not the case with this parable. Romans 3 verse 10 says, There is not one good, no, not one. So let's not miss the point and make this about good versus evil. All ten, all ten virgins have lamps. And not just lamps, but they have their lamp. The scripture is very clear. In verses 3 and 4 and 7, it's talking about their own individual lamp. They all have their own lamp, not somebody else's. They're not sharing the lamps. And the lamps represent each virgin's, each bride's individual profession of their faith. They are declaring their faith by becoming a part of God's family, by being the bride here. All ten profess to believe. All ten profess to have faith. All ten profess to be preparing themselves to meet the bridegroom. All ten are getting ready to be married. And yet we're told that five are wise and five are foolish. So it's not about a profession of their faith by mouth or words. It's about a conversation of hearts by faith. That's what this is all about. And what we also recognise is that all ten want to greet the bridegroom. They all had the same purpose. They all wanted to meet the bridegroom. They all wanted to be married to him. They were all waiting for him to come. They were all waiting and they all had the same intention. Now that's important too. They all had the same intention. The problem is... Good intentions are only that. Good intentions are only intentions. And good intentions do not equal a golden pass in the kingdom. Just because you have intentions doesn't mean that you carry them out. And so in verse 2 of Matthew 25, the only difference with these ten virgins, these ten brides, was that five are wise and five are foolish. Don't miss that point. All ten thought they were ready. All ten thought they were getting ready to meet the bridegroom, even the five foolish virgins. But they weren't. They had a form of godliness. They had a form of religion. But it was only a Form. It was only an outward appearance. And in this story, they all look the same. The ten virgins all look the same. They've all gone to get ready to meet the bridegroom. They've all taken their lamps with them. They're all getting ready. But verse 3 says this, They that were foolish took their lamps, We've learnt that already. But they took no oil with them. They were going to rely on the oil that was within their lamp. But verse 4 says, But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So the only obvious difference between the five foolish and the five wise is that the five foolish didn't plan ahead. They didn't prepare for the long haul. They didn't prepare ahead of time and they didn't take any extra oil with them to be ready in the case of a delay. They 
didn't take any additional oil with him in the event that the bridegroom was delayed. And that's where we want to focus our thoughts, especially in relation to this parable. It's about the lamp and the oil. The lamp is highly significant. It's the most important aspect of this parable. The lamp needs to be lit. It needs to be burning. It needs to be generating light. It's the lamp that distinguishes the bride from the crowd. Because in these days, in the tradition of the Jewish weddings, it was the bride who carried the lamp burning that the bridegroom would see coming and he would identify that that was his bride. The bridegroom knows his bride by virtue of the fact that she's carrying the lamp that is burning. But without the oil, without the lamp burning, it's only an ornament. So it's all about the oil inside the lamp. And the oil inside the lamp was olive oil. In biblical days, when you had a lamp, you put oil in it, which was olive oil. And olives are very hard. They're not like grapes where you can grab a cluster of grapes and squeeze them and, and pour out the juice. Olives are extremely hard. And so to extract the oil, to extract the juice from the olives, it takes extreme pressure and effort. It's not an easy thing to do to extract the oil from the olives. The olive growers would take the olives after harvesting them and they would take them and they'd take them into a stone press with a millstone and they'd press and they'd roll that millstone around the stone to crush and to pulverize these olives. And it would be done under the weight of a great millstone with great pressure and weight. And then the olive pulp, having mashed up the, the, the olives, they would take the pulp and then they'd put it into a press. And they'd press the olive pulp and they'd press it three times to catch the olive oil in the, in, in the, in the pit below. The first press of oil that was taken from the press was given to God. That was the best quality oil. And that was offered to God in recognition of his goodness. The second press went for the people's food and for medication, for medicinal purposes. And the third press was used for cleansing and for light. The olive oil from the third press would then be used in your lamps for illumination. And these three presses, they correlated with the three prayers that Jesus gave in Gethsemane. Jesus is giving this parable on the Mount of Olives. It's an olive grove that he's in. And not far from where he is on the Mount of Olives is Gethsemane, which is inside the Mount of Olives. It's inside the olive grove. And so three presses equated to Jesus, three prayers, where in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to Jesus three, he prayed to God three times. Three times he prayed to God that he might remove this trial that he was going through. Because Jesus was under extreme pressure. He was under extreme pressure just like those olives were. And so he prays to God three times that it might be possible to find another way. Now the oil represents God's word. And Jesus represents the word made flesh. We receive the word of God under extreme pressure. And so... We are called to be the bride of Christ. We are called like these virgins to be his bride. We are engaged to him. And we do that through the waters of baptism. When we rose up out of those waters of baptism and we rose to be born again, we were born again into God's family. We were born into the house of God. We become God's sons and daughters. And now we're engaged to the Lord Jesus Christ because it says in Galatians 3 that we are children of God by faith and through the waters of baptism we are born into Jesus Christ. And now as his bride we are waiting for him. We are waiting for his coming. We are waiting for him to come and to establish God's kingdom. 
and he will identify us by our lamps, by your lamp and by my lamp. And so he will identify us because of our lamp. If our lamp is burning, he will recognize us. If our lamp is not burning, he won't recognize us. He won't know who we are. So it's essential, it's important that our lamps are burning, that we are keeping them filled with oil. In Matthew 5 and verse 14 to 15, Jesus says these, Ye are the light of the world. Now imagine that. Jesus, the Son of God, says to you and to me, You're the light of the world. He says, A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. He says, I don't want you to hide your light. He goes on to say, don't hide your light under a bushel. What's the point in having a, a, a light and then hide it? He said, so you're the light of the world. I want the world to see your light. He says, I want you to make sure that your light is seen. We need our light to be seen in our city, in our country. We need our light to be seen in this world like never before. We're the light of the world. We have the word of God. We have the oil in our lamps burning. And so he says, I need you to light up this city, this country, like never before. Did you know that when you fill a lamp with oil and you light the lamp, do you know what happens to the oil? What happens to the oil is when you light your lamp is that the oil in your lamp goes down. The concept, the idea that Jesus wants us to see here is that when our lamp is burning, the oil is going down. That's an important aspect of this parable. When you live a life in Christ, when you are a true son or daughter of God, we are burning the oil during our days. And the oil is being consumed. And so as a result of that, we need to fill our lamps with oil again. Having burnt the oil during the course of the day, we need to fill our lamps. That's the lesson here. That's the important part of this lesson here that we're, we're, we're considering in this parable of the ten virgins. We need to keep filling our lamps. And then we need to keep burning the oil in our lamps. And then we need to keep refilling it again and burning it again. Day after day after day, we are filling ourselves with the Word of God. We begin our days by filling ourselves up with the Word of God. We use that oil during the course of the day for people to see us as the light of the world. And at the end of the day, we fill our lamps again. And the significance of this is found in the tabernacle in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 27 and verses 21, or verses 20 to 21, and in Leviticus 24, verses 1 to 4, we find the details of the seven-branch lampstand. The lampstand was a part of the furniture of the holy place. And the lampstand was a symbol of God's continuous presence in the lives, in the daily lives of the people. Because it was an illuminating light. And the light was always lit. The lamp was always burning. But for that to happen... For that lampstand to be continually burning, it was going to require effort and commitment from God's children, from the children of Israel, from the children of God. And it was going to be required every day. This wasn't a once a week thing, just rock up to the, to the temple once a week like some of us do to church. This was going to require an effort and a commitment every day. So every day the children of God had to bring the oil, the olive oil to the tabernacle. And that was going to mean that every day they had to extract the oil from the olives. And they were going to have to do that with that great pressure to extract that oil and with great commitment every day. And they'd bring that to the priest who would then fill the lamp. And Exodus 27 and Leviticus 24 tell us that that happened every morning and every night in the tabernacle. And there's our example. And Jesus is making reference to this when he gives this parable of the ten virgins. That's what God requires from us. 
Our lamps have to be filled every day, morning and night. But it's going to require effort. It's going to require a continuous commitment. It's not something we can do every now and then. In verse 5, the foolish virgins started well. They started with their lamps filled with oil. But because we're told the bridegroom tarried, in other words, he didn't come as soon as they expected him to. He didn't come when they thought he might come. What happens is they fall asleep. And while they're sleeping, their oil runs out. And in verse 6, at midnight, a sudden loud announcement is made. The bridegroom cometh! The bridegroom cometh! Now, midnight's not the time of day when you'd be expecting visitors, expecting announcements, expecting to go to a wedding. It's a totally unexpected time, and that's the point of this parable. It's at an unexpected time that the bridegroom comes. So you can imagine what's happening in this parable of this story. Even though they knew the bridegroom was due to come, it was a shock. It was a shock to the five foolish virgins, and it would have been a shock to the five wise virgins, because at this point, they don't look any difference. And, and it's like, you know, when your phone rings in the middle of the night or two o'clock in the morning, and you say, oh, what's that? And, and it shocks you. And, and then when you answer the phone, it, it's somebody that you're really happy to talk to or really happy to have the phone call from, and you, you soon get excited about the call having been shocked. And that's the case here. The, the, the announcement wakes up everybody, and, and they're all in shock. But verse 7 says, The wise, who had brought additional oil in their vessels, who had kept the word of God and its message close to them, they'd kept the word of God in their hearts, it says that they trim their lamps. So they do some maintenance on their lamps. They put the, the, the oil into it and they go forth and join the bridegroom with their lights and lamps burning brightly. But in verse 8, the foolish virgins who have also wakened in shock, they have no oil. They have no oil to replenish their lamps undoubtedly panic sets in because if you're one of those five foolish virgins you would know that you don't have any oil and you would know that without oil without oil there can be no light and without the light you cannot be recognized by the bridegroom and in desperation they try to beg and borrow, and eventually, deep down, they would know that it's a lost cause. In the parable, of course, they go to buy the oil, but we cannot buy our faith. We cannot buy the knowledge and the relationship that we have with our God. What's really important here is that Jesus has this phrase that he uses. It's a phrase that he uses many times. 14 times Jesus uses this phrase in the New Testament. And he says these words. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Because Jesus knows that we don't take enough time in our daily lives to stop and to listen. In the parables of the sower, the good Samaritan, the prodigal son, Jesus introduces his parables, his stories, his messages with the words and the themes of hearing, listening, taking notice. And it's like, it's like when Jesus addresses the people with these parables, it's like he starts by saying, stop, stop and listen. Hear what I've got to say. Because what I've got to say is a matter of life and death. This is really important. I want you to listen carefully. I want you to listen and learn. And it's like Jesus has anticipated everybody's busyness. We're all busy, busy, busy. And it's like Jesus 
wants us to slow down and listen and, and take notice of the words that have been left on record for us. Words like Isaiah 55 and verse 3, where the prophet says, Incline your ear, listen, listen, incline your ear, listen into me carefully, he's saying. And come unto me and hear, hear, there's his theme, and your soul shall live. That's amazing. If we listen, if we hear the word of God, we're going to live. And he says, I will make an everlasting covenant or promise with you. Can you see that? Can you see that? He's saying, listen, hear me, and live. Live forever. It's an everlasting promise. Stop and listen. In verse 6, he says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Today is an, a, a day of opportunity. Today is our day that we can stop and listen to the word. Today is a day where we can fill our lamps up with oil again. And he says, Call upon him while he's near. God is close by. He's not willing that any should perish. He wants all of us in the kingdom. This parable is all about a relationship with God and with Jesus. It's about you knowing him. That's what this parable is all about. It's about you knowing him. It's about you preparing to meet your bridegroom, to meet him. It's about you being ready for his coming, ready for the announcement of his arrival. And that's seen in your lamp. That's seen in your burning lamp. Will you be recognised when the bridegroom comes? And so in verse 10, while the world panics in confusion and uncertainty, while the foolish virgins search for a solution to their problem, we're told that the wise, the bride, they go and meet their bridegroom. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that scene? Can you imagine the sheer excitement and joy of the bride going to meet her bridegroom? It's like seeing that that special friend, that, that, that family friend or, or even a member of your family that you, you haven't seen for a long time. And suddenly someone says, they're coming, they're coming. And you, you run out to meet them and you greet them and you embrace them. It's so amazing. You throw your arms around them. You're so happy. It's not something to be fearful for. It's something we should embrace with excitement and joy and passion. And you know, when I think of that scene, when I think of, of seeing Jesus for the first time and running to him, I think of Mary Magdalene. I think of that beautiful story where after Jesus had been raised from the dead and, and they see each other and, and, and Mary rushes to hug him and to hold him, to never let him go again. And Jesus says, this is not the time, Mary. I have to go. I have to go to my father in heaven, but I'm going to come back. There'll be a time for this. And it's almost like I, as, as the two of them meet and, and see each other, I can almost see Jesus saying, now's the time. Give me that hug. And, and they embrace and we will embrace. And it'll be the most exciting and amazing and just heartfelt time. Most incredible time in our lives. What, a, what, a, what an amazing time that will be. And the bride are taken with the bridegroom to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to be with our Lord, with our bridegroom forever. And the door is shut. In the same way God shut the door of the ark in the days of Noah. And only Noah and his wife and his three children and their wives were saved. And the rest of the world was shut out. So it's important that we watch. It's important that we prepare. It's important that we're filling our lamps up with oil at every opportunity. Because it's hard to imagine in verses 11 to 12 these words being said to us. Imagine being rejected. Imagine having that door closed on us. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine anything worse than the Lord Jesus Christ looking out and saying to me, 
I don't know you. I don't know you. And standing there with an empty vessel. Jesus concludes this parable. He concludes this story with the words, watch, watch, watch and get ready. Prepare, be ready. For you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of God cometh. It's a warning to us. It's also words of encouragement for us. Like it or not, this COVID period has given us a, a time and an opportunity to stop. To stop and listen to the word of God. To incline our ear and listen for the word of God. To assess our lamps. To assess our oil. To assess our relationship with our God and with our Lord. To incline our ear. Because it's all about a relationship. John 17.3, the words of Jesus say, This is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Today, this week, it's a time for us to fill our lamps. It's a time that we can fill our lamps with oil, to love our Father and his Son for all they've done for us, to shine in this dark world, that we might illuminate this city, this country, this world like it's never been illuminated before. Jesus says in Matthew 6 verses 16 to you and to me, let your light shine before others. There's our responsibility and our obligation to let our light shine before others. We don't put it on a shelf. We don't put it away for emergency. We are to let it shine before others so that they might see so that they might see our good works and give glory not to us, but to our Father, to our Father who is in heaven. May it be that we use the days that remain to fill our lamps with oil, to burn brightly in this dark world as we prepare to meet our Lord and go into the marriage supper of the Lamb and forever be with our Lord in the kingdom of God. Amen.